All right, y'all. Well, we will go ahead and get started this evening. Thank you for being here. I know that Mr. Kidd will be here shortly, so we, um, we'll go ahead and get going. First thing on the agenda tonight is to look at our board calendar. So I think each of you in front, in front of you should have a copy of the yearly calendar. Um, just a few highlights, things to point out. We know we have summer graduation on Thursday. Um, next Tuesday, we have a public hearing on the budget. Um, and then celebrate our schools is the 12th. Um, one of the things that you will notice as you look through here, our board field trip days um, have been set. Some are on Fridays. There are some on Wednesdays or Thursdays as well. So there is a little bit of a variety there um, on the field trip days. Now, one of the things that we are going to recommend this year, I just want to get your feedback on it and see if you're okay with it, is doing the ambassador awards the same day that we have our board field trip so that we're not going back for a secondary trip. I'm on, um, yeah. everybody's, if everybody's okay with that, that'll be the plan. Um, be a little change for our campuses, but I th it'll give us uh, more people to recognize our winners, which is a nice thing. Right. Uh, so we'll do that. And then I'm um, looking ahead at our um, board meetings this year. So last, you know, last year we had a uh, feeder zone to be recognized at each board meeting. And um, we were uh, talking about that this morning and, you know, this idea of how do we do that differently just so that it doesn't turn into the same thing and it doesn't turn into each campus topping each other every time. And actually, Dr. Winkler had a great idea this morning of instead of going campuses this year, maybe alternating. So we did campuses last year and then this year, maybe highlighting departments within the school district. So perhaps with a video um, highlighting a department and, um, and, and their contributions um, to the district, which I think is a uh, a good plan. I just want to see if that sounds acceptable to you all. Um, so each month we may, may highlight a, uh, you know, one month might be transportation, the next month could be. As long as there's uh, no undue burden payments. on them. I mean, I don't know if transportation has a bandwidth to put together a video, but. Well, we, we do that for them. Okay. So but basically it's That's it's right. pretty. Have a parade out here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty low impact on the departments, and I do think they would appreciate the opportunity to highlight I mean, I some of the great things going on in each department. So, as as, yeah, okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. Well, we will make that shift and and uh, formulate a calendar for that moving forward as well uh, to get that done. So, okay, Doctor No, the only question I had is on May of twenty twenty. Yes, sir. The last day of school is. Which day? I'm trying to recall. Is it the 28th? It's like 28th May? to me. I think it's the 28th, but I just want to, because it says that's early release that day. Yes, that'd be the last day. Okay, all right. So it's still going to be after. <coughs> Correct. Okay. Yes. And then this will be our last year. Um, without Grand Oaks right. as a graduation. It'll be an so, extra night. Yeah, following the, following the next school year, we'll, we'll add Grand Oaks to the mix as well. That'd be great. Yeah, hey, one, more, one more day. Yes. In, in that regard, is there any way that we can do two a day at you know, morning and an afternoon at... Is that a consideration? Um, the challenge at the pavilion for a morning and an afternoon is parking. You know, if it's a weekday event um, during you know during a weekday, it's hard to, to have parking in that area because most of the pavilion parking is at a, in, in a business parking lot. Um, we did do it one time when we had to reschedule Oak Ridge. Um, the weekend has typically been um, reserved for Bonnie's Dance Studio. They do their big thing there indeed so um never mind but we i know that mr colson has been discussing options with the pavilion moving forward because we do understand that we may have to think that way could be two in a day could be different options um moving forward so okay thank you very much all right our next um portion is uh Mr. Rice is going to 
uh, give some highlights of the budget presentation, which I know you have seen a couple of times, but uh, specifically tonight, we want to highlight the um, budget presentation as it relates to what will be shared with you regarding a potential bond issue in November. Um, so he'll hit those highlights, Mr. Rice. All right, well, good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Noll, it is my pleasure to provide you with an update to the 2019-2020 budget. Tonight, we are just gonna focus on a few of the items in, within the budget. Uh, first off is we did receive our certified values last week, so we'll give an update on our certified values and the effect that they have on our budget. Um, we'll also uh, have a little bit more discussion on the creation of our capital maintenance fund. Um, then we'll also have the tax rate proposal that we'll be recommending for the board's adoption. Uh, continued use of possible use of fund balance to uh, assist a potential bond. And then we'll also look at uh, a comparison of raises that, that, that we've seen other districts do. So we'll, we'll, we'll look at that. So first, we'll start with our certified property values. Property values actually came in above what we were estimating. We were estimating about 5.5%. Property values actually came in at 6.56%. It added about $2.3 billion to our property value, bringing our total certified value to $38.08 million. However, what we're going to see, and I'm going to demonstrate for you here tonight, is with House Bill 3, that increase in property values did not generate us any additional revenue in the general fund. I think that's very important. And we're going to see where increased property values are actually the state is the beneficiary. So uh, this next slide will kind of demonstrate that to you. This is our 2019-2020 funding estimate. The first column there is uh, based off of the estimate, estimate that y'all saw at the July 16th board meeting, and we were estimating about a 5.5% uh, AV growth. That growth in included the uh, tax revenue decrease based on the compression of our tax rate that is required by House Bill 3. Uh, that that cost $7.76 million. Our tax revenue increase based off the tax rate buy-down of the funds that we were transferring to the uh, debt service fund, that $10 million. So our total tax revenue increase um, based off of our 5.5% AV growth was $2.24 million. However, if you look on the certified value in the right-hand column, you can see that that tax value, that, that tax revenue increased to $5.9 million, which is an increase on the tax side of $3.66 million. Now let's look at the next row on the state revenue. Based off of our 1,350 student growth and House Bill 3, uh, with a 5.5% AV growth, we were estimating $45.11 million of new state revenue. However, based off of the increased uh, uh, tax value, that, tax, that state revenue actually decreased by the same amount, $3.66 million, uh, $3 million dollar for dollar. State revenue is now $41.45 million. So it, as you can see, our total estimated available funding did not change based on uh, that increase of certified value. So I think that's very important to look at. <clears throat> this next slide is just looking at our projected expenditure budget. Nothing has changed here since our, uh, six, our uh, last board meeting. You can see we have additional personnel for growth. That's to support our 1,350 new students, 10.98. Salary increase, 3 to 3.5%, 3 14.05 million. We have a potential employee retention stipend in there, $5 million. That's basically a, a 1% uh, stipend that, that we could consider. And I think when we look at the other districts' uh, raises that we compare to, you'll see that that's going to be very important moving forward. Um, House Bill 3 affects uh, full-day pre-K, CTE, bilingual, dyslexia, all the different programs, um, requirements of $7.29 million. Uh, other expenses, uh, utilities, insurance, fuel, and supplies, $1.81 million. Uh, the TRS in-kind funds, that $5 million is just an offset, a requirement from TRS that we're required to report that in our financial statements. Uh, and then you can see the transfer to the capital maintenance fund. And at last month's board meeting, the board approved a transfer of $10 million to the capital maintenance fund to seed that fund. And what we're doing is we're recommending an the, the $10 million that we used to send to the debt service that we're no longer able to send, we're, we're recommending using that fund to further uh, enhance the capital maintenance fund that will allow us to uh, take up to, if it's over five, let's say it's a five uh, year bond program, we're able to take $10 million for five years, which is $50 million of, of items that might be considered 
maintenance projects in a bond program that we can pull those out, pay for that with general fund or capital out of the capital maintenance fund. We can, we can set that fund up and that will actually save the taxpayers over $40 million in interest differential. I don't want to say savings, it's a differential. And, and so, you know, that is, that is a bonus for our taxpayers. So any questions on that capital maintenance fund and what we're, what we're talking about there? Okay. So this is our 2019-2020 projected budget. Um, on the revenue side, our beginning revenue budget is $502.27 million. We're adding $53.35 million worth of revenues uh, for a total uh, revenue budget of $555.62 million. On the expenditure side, our beginning expenditure budget was $495.45 million. Uh, no change in our expenditures, like I said, $54.13 million. That gives us a projected expenditure budget of $549.58 million. And that leaves us with a budget surplus of a little over $6 million. So this is our 2019-2020 uh, proposed tax rate, just kind of concentrating on the middle column. Um, House Bill 3, by the formula itself, compresses our tax rate from $1.06 uh, to $0.97. Cents. That is a $0.09 cent tax decrease. On the debt service side, our, our tax rate is actually going to increase from $0.22 cents to $0.26.5, cents, which is a $0.4.5 cent tax increase. That'll leave us with a total tax rate of $1.235 or a tax reduction of four and a half cents. Um, working, you know, talking with our bond council, tax assessor collector, and the state comptroller's office, 26 and a half cents is the tax rate that we must adopt. Um, that is the amount that is required to service our debt service. Um, our uh, bond council said that, you know, House Bill 3 prohibits the use of the surplus in the general fund to uh, buy down your debt service tax rate. So with taking that out, 26 and a half cents is the uh, tax rate that we must adopt. Um, so once again, our total tax rate of $1.23 and a half, which is a four and a half cent tax increase. And I, and I do feel we're, we're getting the information from all other school districts. I, I do feel that we will still be in great position when we compare ourselves to not only Montgomery County, but every school district in our area that, that we compare with. Can you restate that one more time, that what, what bond council advised you about? Yeah, in, in, in House Bill 3, um, it prohibits school districts, and I, I, I wrote this down just, just in case I had that question. House Bill 3 prohibits school districts from increasing the <coughs> MNO tax rate to create a surplus to pay down the debt, meaning to buy down the debt surplus <coughs> tax rate, and that is what we were effectively doing with our $10 million. And our bond council said that our action in that is actually in the spirit of that law. That's why that law was enacted. And, and, and he said that is within the spirit of that law. Then working with the county uh, tax collector assessor through the truth and taxation documents that we had to, had to create, and then with the state uh, comptroller's office, all those documents came back and the calculation said we must adopt 26 and a half cent. 26 and a half cent tax rate. The tax assessor collector actually said she would not sign off on a lower tax rate. So that, you know, that is, uh, you know, the tax rate that we're required to, to adopt with those, with that guidance. In other words, we have to adopt a tax rate that is equivalent to pay all to pay the debt. debt. Yes, sir. In accordance with its schedule. Yes, sir. That is correct. That makes sense. That is correct. Um, so at a dollar 23 and a half is what, is what our tax rate would be. And, and really House Bill 3 effectively effectively the state is setting our tax rate in this first year of the house bill 397 cents on the MNO side and then uh, the, the 26 and a half cent on the debt side so this is just a pay increase comparison with uh, the other districts you know our peer districts and uh, you know other Montgomery County school districts just so you can see um, where other districts are in their pay raises um, several of them are doing the retention stipend and they're quite high. Umble, Umble ISD, uh, their retention stipend is going to be $1,400. Aldine, uh, although they're giving a 7% and 8%, they're also going to uh, uh, give professional staff a $1,000 stipend. Um, Klein ISD is also going to give a $1,500 teacher, counselor, and librarian uh, stipend and then $1,000 for all other employees. 
a new Caney ISD on top of their 5% is going to give an $800 stipend. KDISD is going to give two 1% stipends uh, in the year. Uh, Magnolia ISD um, is going to actually give a, a various amounts for different ratings, 750 for teachers with one to five years, 1,000 for six plus years, and then $500 stipend for all others, uh, you know, and, and down the line. SciFair is uh, going to give two $500 stipends uh, throughout the year. Well, why is kind of, uh, they all look pretty compressed except all name. Why is that? Um, all these number is, is a lot of it is their, the way that their comp ed numbers uh, fell out because comp ed, there's a lot of weights within the state funding formula for comp ed, and they just have a lot of students that qualify for the more severe categories of that comp ed. So it, it generated them a lot more uh, revenue in that area. Their, their gain per student in the new formula was twice as much as our gain. Oh, right. Student. Yes. Okay. So they, you know, there's always a winner and a loser in the, in the formula. They happen to be in the real sweet spot of gaining a lot of money. Hmm. But deservedly so. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So on the, the retention stipend, if there's there's not a yes or to be determined, am I to assume that it's a no? Fort Bend is no. Yes, that they're, they're not offering it, correct. They're not offering it. Yeah. Right. I'd like to go back, um, mm -hmm. if you can, to, to the pay increase, not to that, but to, to the pay increase Yes. for the salaries and how we determine that because the state in their new formula said, you have to, we, we're giving you $14 million, mm -hmm. and this has to go towards teacher's salary. Yeah, in, in House Bill 3, um, it requires 30% of your gain that you gain from House Bill 3 to be spent uh, on raises for teachers, librarians, counselors, and nurses, mm -hmm. and all other employees excluding administrators. 75% of that 30% must be spent on the teachers, librarians, counselors, and nurses. Uh, that, come, that came out to, in the calculation, about a 2.5% raise uh, for, for our teachers. As you can see, we're exceeding that amount. We're giving 3% um, for teachers with five or less years of experience, and we're giving 3.5, or... or, or yeah, 3.5. Three, um, yeah, 3.5, I'm sorry. 3.5 plus $500 for any teacher with uh, uh, six years or more experience. So one of the concerns I know we all had and we talked about was this is this is good for two years mm -hmm. and the state may decide not to fund that next year, but yet teachers are not going to, we can't continue to fluctuate. So in the formulas that we're doing, are, are we, I guess we don't have to worry about it for two years as far as our budget, our, us building this raise into our budget later on, having to pay for it instead of the state pay for it. Is that, did I ask that question right? Could, could you just restate it? Yeah, sorry. So what I'm saying is this, the reason that this calculation came up is because the state of Texas is telling us this is what we need to do. Correct. And this is money that's coming from, hey, we're giving you this money, but some of this, but this percentage has to go towards salaries. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, if that had not come up, we would have had to come up with some type of way to address if we were going to give an increase, if we weren't, and how much, stuff like that. Yes, sir. So my point is, two years from now, when the state gets back together, they may say that didn't work, and we're not, we're not, we're not giving you that formula again. But for consistency with our teachers and administrators, we would need to address that. That that so that's, form, my, that's yeah, my that, point. That is. formula that that I talked about is actually written into the law, and in the and in the next legis, legislative session, if they increase the basic allotment. Only if they increase the basic allotment, it will trigger that we will have to do that formula again. We will have to use 30% of that increase. So, so. I, I get that, but what I'm saying is there's a lot of, there's ifs. Yes. There's, there's a lot of ifs to this, and unfortunately school districts are left with, we, we can't play with ifs. You know, yes. we've, got a, we've got a budget for salaries, we've got a budget for these things. Are we doing our due diligence to make sure that we're building, we're building those, this increase into our budget to where we can pay for it if the state of Texas says, no, we're not going to. Yes, sir. And, and, and if you'll look, you know, we, 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 we are showing a surplus of about $6 million mm -hmm. uh, in this budget. And, and our recommendation is going to be that we hold on to that surplus and we not only use it for the 2020 21 budget, but if there, you know, and, and into the future. You know, this board has done a wonderful job of not spending all the money 
in the first year because we've seen a lot of districts over the years. They get that money and they spend it all. Might be some of these that we're looking at on the screen right here, mm -hmm. but and they spend it all in the first year. That's why holding that holding that money and when we get into the early spring, we can determine at that time, hey, we're able to come out with raises a little earlier. We'll know what percent we can afford and we'll be able to do that earlier. Okay, thank does you. That, does that answer your Yes, point? it does. I, I do think that uncertainty is why you see this retention stipend column being so filled because it, it doesn't have any future obligation tied to it. So it. I think that's why you see a lot of school districts using that as a one-year um, stipend so that you know, they don't carry that, that, that raise moving forward or that portion of the raise moving forward. So it, um, you know, we're seeing a lot more of that now than we did previously, and I believe that's why. Okay. Okay, I wanted to talk to you all a little bit about our fund balance analysis. And, uh, you know, we have a stated objective to have 25% of our budget in our fund balance. Um, TEA requires 90 days worth of cash. That is one of the things in their first report, 90 days worth of cash uh, to receive full points on the first report. Um, however, I've been in conversations with our financial advisor and our rating agencies and talked to them about maintaining 25% of our budget as far as rating agency goes. Um, they said that it is okay, our ratings will not change if we dropped to 20%, as long as we have a objective and we're working towards that objective and it's one-time expenditures that we're looking to expend the money on. Now, if we were going to spend this 5% or, or, or decrease on raises, they would question that. But if it's one-time expenditures, they can see that, that we could build that back up over years and we'd get back to the 20, uh, 25%. So they're okay with uh, the potential of dropping that fund balance requirement down to 20% and using those funds to possibly assist us with the, with the bond referendum. Um, so I just kind of put these percentages up there for you. Um, our 2019-2020 preliminary budget is $549.6 million. 20% of that budget would, would be a requirement of $109.9 .9 million of our fund balance. We're estimating our unassigned fund balance at 831.19 to be $134.1 million. Um, that is 24.4% of our budget. Um, on the 25% target, we're just under it. But if we look at the 20% target, that provides us with about $24.2 million worth of funds that the board would have available that if they so wish, they could use to offset some of the cost of a, a potential bond. So I just wanted to bring Would that. that be allowed to go into the same account, uh, accounting uh, the capital. as the $10 million? <laughs> yes, sir. So, okay. Okay. Any other questions? <clears throat> so, like I said, here's a pro forma for 2020, 2021. Y'all saw this last time. Um, it's showing, you know, currently estimated total revenue of 565.02. Um, with House Bill 3, we're limited to 2.5% growth on our uh, assessed value growth. Um, and that is reflected in the decrease in state funding. So once again, the state is the beneficiary of any uh, tax in, uh, property value increase above 2.5%. Um, that gives us uh, beginning expenditures now, 549.58 million that we just discussed. Estimated expenditures, $22 million. Um, total estimated expenditures, 571.58 million for a potential deficit. Now this is real early, this is, you know, we're reaching out there of $6.56 million. And currently in this budget, as you recall, we're showing about a $6 million surplus. So um, that is the pro forma. And then what's next? Uh, we do have a uh, public hearing on August 6th. And then on August 20th, we'll have a public hearing and then we'll ask the board to adopt the budget and the tax rate at that meeting. I had a quick question. Yes, sir. Um, so as I understand it, we've always been very prudent in keeping 25% as the fund balance, yes, sir. Kind of the safety net. Mm -hmm. um, and I hear what you're saying that we could maybe cut that back a little bit if we wanted to. Historically, say the last 10, 15 years, have we ever had to dive into we? Fund uh, we have not uh, used fund balance other than when we had fund balance over and above any threshold that we had set. Because before it was, if you remember. Uh, a little over 10 years ago, it was 18 to 24%. We had a range 
that we had a range, but when, when we started having more than 25%, we just said it, you know, it was just 20, let's just use 25%. But we used to have a range, and so we did use it, we did use it to, to you know, supplement capital projects. Yeah, in but the lest, the, lest we forget, you know, we're trying to drive a bond, and we're trying to keep the tax rate the same, and we're trying to keep our savings account adequate, and so on and so forth. But every time we reached and grabbed those dollars, that were above that surplus amount, that kept something off that bond. Mm -hmm. Be it Wilkinson, be it safety and security, be it, and it's real easy to talk about that savings that we're going to have on the interest side, but we're forgetting to factor in what we've taken out of cash and put to the put to the test, and that that will happen again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you and and so what I'm saying to you is, have we ever delved into those funds? Is a relative subject, not for cash flow purposes, not on the M and O side. You're 100% act, accurate. We all know that. But we'll no longer have that cushion that we bring over here. You know, I mean, we had less of a cushion to, to step out there and spend $10 million on this, that, or the other. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about on capital improvements. Right. So it, it, is a, it, is a, it does have an effect. Just like not being able to put those dollars over there and use the super pennies to fund that $10 million, we all know that that, that was that that was you know that was a, a, a unique situation, and it's coming to an end, and it's a shame. And if they don't see that, then they just don't have and, both. And, eyes. and and really, what 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 kind of brought the state's awareness to that was all the TREs with the tax. You know, we'll raise it seventeen cents on the M and O side, drop it seventeen on the debt side, and and you know the state was you know having we'll to provide those. Road. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other questions? When Darren will be here, we can ask. We can certainly circle back to any of these questions um, throughout the, the process. Shifting gears a little bit to um, the bond conversation. Looking back at um, our May bond proposal, one of the things in your guidance to me following that proposal was to hear from the community listen to the community, receive feedback from the community. And so we've, we've gone through that process over the last few months. Many of us here have met with multiple, um, some community groups. Um, we had multiple sessions of individual citizens coming in and having a small group conversation, with five to six or seven um, unrelated community members just all coming to the table and sharing feedback and they shared their personal opinions, they shared things that they heard, they, that their friends or neighbors talked about, and so they just provided us a lot of information. I want to share with you a little bit about what they told us, and then we'll talk about the future and how we've tried to uh, address those concerns. So just looking at their overall thoughts. Um, some people perceived that there were luxuries included, um, with like astroturf, astroturf, artificial turf being one of those. Um, there was concern that, um, that just the overall amount in general was just a lot to, to um, accept. Just the number itself was a scary number. Um, that our information was overly complicated um, that we put forth. That there was misinformation out there that, that um, was not addressed. Um, there were some historical projects that caused people some heartburn, um, be it Jet Center slash uh, Sam Houston, uh, or even Conroe High School, um, just as a conversation. Um, that, that all of our teachers weren't necessarily on board, that they didn't, um, and those that maybe their schools weren't receiving as many projects didn't see the, the benefit. Uh, we need to communicate the urgency of need better. The timing of the election was uh, of concern that many people talked about being off uh, in May, not in November. Um, specific problems in the package, I'd, I asked people about that as well. Turf came up, the teacher training center came up as a conversation piece, and then maintenance items in the bond came up as a, a conversation piece as well. Um, as we would ask folks about ideas for future, for future bond or how we could do it differently or better, um, items that we heard, the Probably the most common one was, um, I mean, to put it very simply, the, the uh, KISS principle, keep, a, keep it simple. 
uh, you know, just this, reduce some of the complexity in the package. Um, communicate it differently. Um, make sure the community understands that the 2015 bond was a four-year bond. Um, better educate the community. Um, communicate to the public the ramifications of the bond not being successful was uh, stressed to us as well. Uh, remove the fluff from the package, tighten the package. Uh, and then a recommendation of doing a package A and a package B potentially. And then that safety and security needs to be um, highlighted more and, and discussed more uh, in the package. So wonderful feedback. Certainly appreciate everybody that put in the time to come and, and uh, share that with us. So on this first document that you'll see titled Be Listened, this is the um, direct response to the conversation that we heard uh, with the package that we bring forward tonight. And once again, everything you're seeing tonight is certainly in draft form. We understand it's the first time you've seen it. Our point here tonight is to receive feedback and we make any adjustments that you see fit. Um, it started when we allocated $20 million from our fund balance at last month's board meeting. 10 million of that went to the capital maintenance fund, eight and a half million to purchase land and 1.5 million to purchase buses. That 20 million came directly off of the bond um, package. So there was, a, all of those items were included. So based on the, that 20 million plus the potential interest, that's a net savings of $36 million when you consider in interest. Uh, the additional allocation of the 10 million annually, as Darren mentioned, um, to our capital maintenance fund, that, re that results in a $50 million reduction in the bond proposal. Uh, additionally, with the, um, that avoids $40 million in interest payments. We've extended the bond from four years to five years. Um, one of the other pieces of feedback we heard is that it just felt felt like we were back quickly. The last bond was a four-year package, and so that idea of getting to a more uniform election day in the future, five years away, a potential presidential election date, um, seemed to make sense. By doing so, we've added an additional elementary school to this package uh, from what was included in the 807. The last item cut from the May bond was an elementary school. That uh, was the, the last thing that we cut. We knew it was going to be the trigger for the next bond, so it was included in this package. We removed the teacher training center, ag complex, and all work at the jet center from the package. Those are no longer included in the bond program. Um, future consideration will be given to these projects. Um, for example, we do believe that with the new um, career and technical funding that the ag complex may be able to be funded out of cash. And then we'll be looking at um, the future of the Jet Center and Teacher Training Center down the road. We removed the addition at Conroe High School ninth grade campus. That's a almost a $12 million reduction from the bond. Um, we do know that there will be another high school in Conroe soon, based on the demographic study showing you know, 6,000 students in Conroe in the next 10 years. We understand that there will be a second high school, so we can, um, through the use of portable buildings and um, utilization of the main campus, potentially moving students from the ninth grade to the main campus, we can make that work till we get to that point. Remove the custodial maintenance facility from the package. That was $10.1 million. It will be funded by that capital maintenance fund. The Hawk building conversion will also be funded by the capital maintenance fund. So essentially both of those are being funded through cash with no debt. Uh, reduction of technology from 36 million to 20 million uh, in this package. Um, financing of buses and any technology in the package will be done for 10 years, 10 year financing on those items. Um, everything else that would be financed would be 25 years. And then movement of the turf for the high schools into a proposition B. So voters would have that choice. 
uh, turf would stand alone as a Proposition B, and it can pass or fail um, on its own as a Proposition B gives voters more choice. So just in summary, you can see a reduction of the total package from $807 million to a Proposition A package of $660 million and a Proposition B for the turf at $23.8 million. This, uh, if both uh, propositions were to pass, it would result in no tax rate increase for our taxpayers. Uh, so you can see our, our, as Darren's already mentioned, our tax rate. So the one or both uh, propositions passing would result in no increase. So, um, Sarah, if you want to put the... So just to get can a, ask you a couple you questions. can please absolutely so um, with delaying the ag complex mm -hmm. that doesn't do anything to jeopardize the donation of that land from the county mm -hmm. there was not a time limit on getting a building up there no sir we, we're still fine it was a 99 year lease we'll, we'll okay. be um, well to do that moving forward okay and just a historical question between the 2015 bond and looking at you know 600 something million here over a billion dollars in bond money with no tax increase. Has that ever been done before that we can think of? Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure. being able to fund. Yeah. I mean, it's based on growth. Dollars. You know, I mean, yeah. really, it's driven by growth. It's driven by new communities. It's driven by um, new development. And so I think fast growth school districts is where you see that mm -hmm. as we are labeled a fast growth school district by the state of Texas. So that is where you, you see that, where the new people moving in pick up their share of the... That is, that... A new that is, I can't wrap my mind around a billion right. dollars with no tax increase. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hey, Glass looks, looks, looks low, the Prop the prop A. My concern with the Prop B, if we, if we put it out there just on its own, I don't think it has a chance to pass. I would most of prefer to put the Prop B, the turf, and something we pay out of cash and move one of these other capital projects back over on Prop A and just propose one bond proposal to the Prop as opposed to the Prop Well, you know, we have a question. Go ahead. Uh, well, well, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. But we do have a little bit of history with regard to a Prop A, a Prop B, and that was when we did the natatorium, we put that on a Prop B. Okay, yeah. and and yes, sticking it out there by itself jeopardizes it, you might say. But on the other hand, it you can argue that it allows the public to have their say. If the people in the other feeder zones feel like equalization, you know what grand how we built Grand Oaks, they deserve that at their school system. They voted, and if they don't, we can keep grass on the junior varsity fields in the baseball field but you, you know what I'm saying it does allow them to speak directly to it sometimes we represent and we make decisions here that we're appointed to be you know to act for constituents but in that particular case there can be an I'm not saying right or wrong I'm not telling you wrong I'm simply saying that it is cool that the voters can actually vote on something themselves and I mean it pass or fail they, they decide uh, the, that's, a, that's you know, all I was going to say. The concern, I have, the concern I have, I share with probably <clears throat> Mr. Williams, is, you know, about the turf, I heard some issues or some complaints from people that really didn't understand the issue mm -hmm. and those that think, they automatically think football mm -hmm. or sports, and that's all that this is about or just the varsity level when you're you know, you're talking about affecting a number of kids that participate in all kinds of extracurricular activities that is a that is a wholeness of an education other than just in the classroom i mean i i'd like to kind of have discussion about that issue and and what all is involved there because as i understand it talking to Others that, um, you know, when you, because of the rains that we always get, mm -hmm. you're canceling junior high games because there's no place to play. And it's not just the games, it's the, 
it's the those that are participating in halftime, band, drill team, it's the whole the whole package as opposed to a lot of people look at oh turf, you know, they just want that for sports, so let's throw that out. So I'd like to kind of have a discussion with everybody, you know, about about that. If I can just get maybe go dig a little deeper into the feedback portion that that, that we heard. Um, you know, my initial thought was that turf wouldn't come forward at all out of May. That was just my initial thought. Um, but the feedback I heard was very strong both ways. All right? There were strong opinions that it didn't belong. Um, we didn't need it at all, anywhere. Uh, and then there were strong opinions of folks that that's the reason that they were engaged in the process to begin with in May. And so um, the, through the conversation of both supporters of turf and those that were anti-turf, um, as we threw this idea out to, the, to our public groups, they seemed to be very receptive to this idea of an A and a B. Even those that were supportive of turf said, hey, we like it. If, we'll, if we want it, we'll go. It's our job to get it passed, but we don't want to to, to, mur to you know, murky up the waters on the school side with that topic. So it's... Well, not just utilization. Do we consider savings as Oh, yes. I was sorry, sorry, savings. Are we, are we emphasizing, getting a point across as to what savings come about? I, I was going to address that to question saying, to Mr. Foster. I, I don't see Marshall or maybe a, a Marshall question, too. Do we have... Is he over there behind? Oh, he's behind a pillar. I can't see him. Um, do we have hard numbers on savings, say, for a baseball field that we save X number of gallons in water that we don't have to water turf, or X number of person hours in maintenance, mowing, and aerating, and things yeah, like that? Yeah, I mean, Marshall's collected quite a bit of data on the maintenance that we spend on our fields currently. Uh, putting a dollar value to it's relatively difficult because it varies widely. Sure. Uh, but I don't, know if we've, I don't know if we've got it at, at, you know, kind of on the tip of our tongue today, but we do have it. And then it's part of the advertising process or the, the communication process to, with the communities. Well, uh, that needs to be part of it. I think I think the problem, as you put it, is uh, you know, what does will there be water savings? Of course. Mm -hmm. Will there be injury savings? Of course. Will there be uh, uh, you know less uh, uh, labor involved in mowing and, and upkeep and so on and so forth? Of course. Will there be more games played? Yes. Okay. But put a dollar figure on that and and dare somebody to tell you you're wrong. I mean, it's just a hard number to prove. Well, if we look at the utilization of Grand Oaks, for example, in April and May, when we were getting some torrential rains every every day, every other day, I think there was a playoff game of some type of some school at our campus uh, practically every day in May. Uh, several, of them just CIS. Balls, several of them a day. It wasn't just CIS. Yeah, they were rent either. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Rent. I mean, so they're, the, I mean, that's just an example of utilization. Well, because I mean, when it rains today, we're practicing today. You know, but I mean, how many how many rains do we have, and how many rents do we get? And you know, when you put that into a package, it's hard to put it down to a dollar amount. You know, I know, this, Darren, you don't throw numbers at the public that you can't back up. Right. I know that. Right. And that number, I just I just think that I, 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 I think was just we're playing if, with. That I was just wondering if we even had you know we we estimate that of X ten thousand gallons of water we used at the campus that month. This many of it went to watering sports fields or anything yeah. like that. Yeah, I mean, we, and we have some pretty wide industry level data because yeah. we've got friends at Cy Fair and other school districts that have already made these conversions. Uh, but I know, Marshall, when we were putting this together for the May bond, we did compile how many man hours of grounds crews are on the game field and how many man hours of pest control and weed control and all the other things that go into just keeping the fields green, much less playable. Uh, so the data is there, and, and, and I, I would agree we need to put together a, a uh, um, kind of a robust package of communicating that to the to the outside world, but utilization is 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 the one that's really hard to put a and hard that, number on. That's how the Woodlands Township, we, you know, had a conversation with them. They converted all their fields yeah. years ago, so we did talk to them. They they talk about utilization rate, uh, so there's definitely cost savings as well. But what they really talk about is um, how much more the fields get used mm -hmm. now because they are turf and they don't have rainouts. Um, but it is hard to put a direct sure. dollar uh, on that. My, my opinion would be, though, if it's controversial both ways, mm -hmm. you got strong opinions both ways, if you separate it out, then like you said, whoever's got the people that will come and vote, that's who decides. 
And as a board member, I agree with uh, John. I, I let the voters decide. I mean, it, it is not every school has turf. I think we've been debating the good and things that come from turf, and I would agree with all of those. But there's a lot of schools that are going to say, oh, you know, we don't have turf, they have turf. It's kind of a luxury item. And I think we just need to let the voters decide. And I like the idea of putting it in its own proposition and not attaching it to, uh, because if those opinions are strong, that could somehow mix, trying to mix oil and water, you know, taint the whole bond. And I don't want to have that happen as a possibility. So I'm really in favor of leaving them separated. And if the people want to vote for it, they can vote for it. Or if they don't, they don't. I, I agree with Mr. Sanders. I'm leery of putting things back into that Prop A and jeopardizing some of those, or all of those projects that we absolutely have to have. What is, the, the, what is the max amount on the Prop A side that we could have uh, put forth without a tax entry? Total, 600, uh, 683. We're right at it. Okay, total. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I got a couple of questions if we want to move yes. on from the yes. uh, from the from the turf. I don't want to cut that off. I agree. Go ahead. I guess go ahead. Give, yes, Mr. Is, Hubert. Then. My question was not related to the turf either, but go ahead. Go ahead. I'll wait. I'll wait. Um, next question would be more so how much for each penny increase was the dollar amount associated with? Fifty million, correct, there. Oh, how much more can we yes. get for a penny? About fifty million, yes. Sir. So, if we presented this with a one penny increase, that would account for another fifty million dollars to the bond potential. We'll be told seven thirty. Mm -hmm. That yes, roughly, yeah. That that'd be the capacity of it. How about has there been any consideration of with the Prop A and the Prop B um, recognizing that the turf is a hot issue both ways? Has there um, been any consideration of? Is there anything additionally that we might want to add to Prop B, like the ag complex that yeah, so I know is a... Part of the conversation was um, uh, the teacher training center, uh, as an example, of a potential to have in Prop B as well. Both of those being um, projects that we heard through feedback were there were pros and those for and against uh, both of those projects. Um, ultimately, you know, we decided that we think we can address that need in the future through other means. Um, additionally, this ability to bring this package to the voters with a no tax rate increase um, was appealing to, to, for us to bring that forward to you all. And um, you know, we are addressing a lot of the needs. We're seeing a decrease here, but every department has signed off on the fact that the immediate needs are being met. You look at the amount of cash that is being put into this, the work is getting done. Uh, we're, we've just found a way now to do it through cash and not incurring bond debt, um, but it is absolutely going to meet the needs for our students uh, moving forward. My only concern is that the priority was placed upon no tax increase that you know, we may or may not have met all of our needs. For instance, the removal of Conroe High, ninth grade campus addition. That's, that's a pretty strong one. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that. Well, we can, we can handle that with portable buildings. I, I just don't. I'm, I'm struggling that's with a that great, one because that, speaking of educational, you know. Yeah, I'm struggling with that because I think we did this with the intent of no tax increase. Short term, and not, not a long term. The needs of the I, I could. Well, I don't, I'm not sure that's a. I, I hear you, and I, I agree with with uh, mm -hmm. a lot of what you're saying, but I also think it had to had to do with just listening to what what we were told because I was out there as well I, I've heard a lot of these things as well and you know that the turf was very polarizing like we were talking about it was very polarizing and you know we as constituents we, we represent the taxpayers right so if they said they didn't want it 
you know, we, sh we shouldn't do it. And those, are, those are basically the two things that I heard a lot of, just sharing with you my, no, I, my feedback. I agree. The two I agree. things I heard was the, the turf and then that, that um, uh, the building, you know, the teacher the facility sure. building. So, so I, I, I know that we're also trying to keep the tax rate down and not have a tax rate increase, but I also understand that you're trying to address what, what the community wants as well, and it's a balancing act. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not all just okay. about the tax, but there are going to be some things on here that we're just not going to be able to do at this point yeah. but because we got to get something. I think we gotta, we're saying we one thing, but doing another though. We're saying constantly that some of these things right here were fluff, but nobody's saying they had opposition with the tax rate. I don't but think yet, it's fluff. I, well, I'm not saying the gist it's fluff. of it was that some stuff in here were luxury items. Okay, understood. I get that. That's yeah. true. But yet, our objective seems to be to have no tax increase. Nobody mentioned one time that the, that the general constituents were opposed to the tax increase, the tax rate increase. Well, I heard Dr. Knowles say they thought the bond amount was too large. Yes, and, and we heard that about the tax increase as well. Is that, okay. that we did hear that. And I, all, all I can assure you is that, and I'm speaking for every one of these people that are in this room, we feel like the needs are met, are met here both for the school district but will also be accepted and acceptable by the taxpayers and, and meets their needs we would not bring forward a plan that did not put us in a position to be um, in in great shape moving forward from this day through the next five years that's that's the purpose of this plan and it it does meet those needs i want to assure you that we did not come into this with the target number uh, and work our way down we actually worked the plan and then um, as we as we we didn't even check the tax rate implication to be honest with you, Mr. Williams, until we had worked this plan, and then when we followed back on back up with it, we were within the number, sure. and it was. So, so and you've created it? a five-year bond out of a four-year yes, yeah. bond too. Yeah, so I'm let's saying. not lose track. Of I'm hearing all that, but we put in a bond, Conroe High Ninth Grade Campus Edition. Do we not need that anymore? It, it's a need. Uh, I will tell you that we have a solution for that. Now that's a project that we that's a project that we had a lot of discussion about internally and if that was one that we made a decision to add back in i think it would be justifiable um what's the solution the solution would be we can add more portables at conroe nine and or we can you know move more freshman students to the main campus it's a short-term solution but what we know long term is that conroe high is going to outgrow um, what one single high school can be, and so we will we will build an additional high school in our future in Conroe. When that happens, mm -hmm. whatever if Conroe Nine might be a ninth grade campus, it could return to a junior high. Whatever its future life. Yeah, that makes sense. That way, it's, you're not building it so large, then it's too big. Correct. So if you waited and and tried to manage with the growth you're going to have until you get to the place where you need to build a high school another high school, then you should have enough for 9 through 12 at each of the new high schools. Is that, let me, let me, that what you're saying? Yes, sir. Okay. Let me ask a question. We, we've always heard, and uh, I've always heard, excuse me, I, I don't know if it's right or not, that we try to be at 125% of capacity before we rebuild. Okay? So where are we with ninth grade campus, and when will it be at plus 25% so, of capacity? So our current model is to go lower than, it's not 25% now, our, our current model is we try to be closer to 110%, just based on the idea that portables, there are safety concerns from parents, they are not okay. nearly as efficient as they All used right. to be. Well, like I said, that's that fine. Yes. So where are we the, now? The ninth grade campus. Right now we're at, we're at a current capacity of 1,100. We're projecting 1,100 for this coming year. So and we project in 2023-24 year, to be at 1,411 students. So that'll put us at 128% in, in well, we can't do that. 23 or 24. I mean, that's like cutting our nose off, spot our face. Which, which ninth graders are you going to bring back over here? Huh? Where are you going to put them? You know, I mean, well, yeah, where are you going to put them? This one's growing too, but where are you going to put them at Conroe High School? I, I, uh, you know, as opposed to I told you my thoughts on the thing, I absolutely agree. I, I do not see 
except that we're trying to meet some kind of, well, you know, like I said, I, I understand y'all worked hard at cutting. I, I got that, okay? And I am not belittling that, okay? And I do believe you have to listen to the voters. But when you tell me that before this bond is up, okay, you will be at t more than twice of what overcapacity of what you consider to be time to build another school, mm -hmm. okay? And we're going to count on portables and, and shipping kids three blocks uh, to another campus that is also filling, if unless I'm mistaken, no. that same period of time, this one's going over over norms too, right? Right. Mr. Hines? Yes. I'm Dr. Hines, excuse me. What, what, what's Conroe High School going to be in that 23, 24 period? Uh, I and I know we just added a thousand seats there, so that's probably not a fair question. But, you know, we can only, like you said, we can only make a high school so big. The, the total will be around 5150 for the two campuses. If you added it back, what would be your tax on So it's it'd be 11.9 million is what that addition costs. Now, one option from, that Mr. Rice did share is that we, you know, there is a potential there of utilizing some fund balance money. So there's, you know, 24 million roughly in fund balance. So uh, they, they're uh, already, they already got us fund balancing and, 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 and uh, for buses and for what they call maintenance, what I call for long-term life cycle and so on and so forth. But when we go to put an $11 million additions on schools into cash, okay, I, I'm telling you with that super penny change, I mean, you're looking at a higher tax rate than we proposed in the 807 already. And, and I understand it's going down, but that's the state. And, you know, we're not going to have that excess AV to, to fund these balances in the future. You can only count on a, uh, uh, two and a half what, is, what is it, population growth, student growth. Yeah, two and a half percent. Water growth. You've got that, and you've got a percentage of people paying their taxes late, so we get some penalty dollars. <laughs> I mean, there's only so much to go around. But, you, you know, putting another $11 million in cash... I mean, that's. Uh, I'm concerned Can about some of these projects be phased in? I mean, is the eleven, is the twelve million dollars eleven point nine? Is is that how many classrooms are we talking about? Because we built an addition on to iron, ten classrooms, about ten, and it was less than that, I think. Yeah, that, the iron's addition was uh, eight ten classrooms, and, and it was a little under five million. Yeah, but it's a junior high, which is a little bit different than a high school. I understand. Uh, and then we're also projecting costs I mean, into the future. I mean, so at eleven nine, that that's the all in figure. Okay. So design, build, and outfit that campus for the. So the all in for irons was well, over to eight or nine. Eight. In the irons addition, the, the building was designed with that idea of that in addition. Mind. I understand. And, Correct. You know the. Site at Conroe Nine is. I understand. Yeah. Yep. Now, there's a fault. And the, there's a, this there's is the reason we're here. Tonight. Like, there's a way though to phase. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, we, we can add that. To make uh, yeah. yeah. And, and I absolutely don't want to to rain on y'all's hard work. Don't trust me when I say that. But when you oh. tell me the school's going to be bigger than it's supposed to be in that same time period, uh, let's cut something else. Let's don't cut that. Well, let me I mean, let me ask you this, if you don't mind. Yes. Um, Kind of dovetail on what Mr. Husband's is saying is, and maybe I was on the things that like the turf and the technology and some of that. I mean, as I understand what possibilities are, those needs could be addressed in the next couple of years in other ways, possibly. But as far as the list over here that we cutting out is, is really the, the ninth grade campus, the one that really affects children. Yes, sir. Absolutely. So the, so the one that affects the children, which are also our constituents, first and foremost in my mind, but as well as taxpayers, but that maybe we consider putting that back in. Mm -hmm. um, and like you said, like I hear Mr. Sanders saying, let the, let the uh, public say what they want about turf. You know, maybe the proposition B, leave that. But, but do we consider putting in the... the so, campus, the one so if I if I made us throw this out there as a thought and just see what you think. So if we were to add Conroe Nine back in, and um, Six. if you were willing to go down to the twenty percent in fund balance, that would be roughly twenty million dollars. Okay, or a little less, a little. We could take a little less. If you said we want to pay for all of the technology out of fund balance cash, 
we add Conroe 9 back into the bond package, we would still come in about $8 million less than what we are right here. We'd come in about 652, and it still puts us without a tax increase. It addresses your concern there, Mr. Kidd, of making sure that we are meeting the needs of the children. Um, I'd like you to put nine, I agree, but take half of the technology and put it over and pay for it out of cash as opposed to the full Yeah, that, that yeah, would be, be fine. 10 million, yeah, yeah. we could take 10 million from fund balance, yes sir. And that would that would reach the- I'm already yeah. concerned with the 660. Yes. Not being sufficient. So I don't want to see that drop. If anything, I'd like to see it go up. But of course, if we do it your way, net net, it'll be about the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With the 10 going back. Right. right. I 10 going over. I like I like moving 10 over from cash. You know, not maybe not doing the full 20, but. Then if you look at technology as a percentage of the bond, it looks it's immaterial. Right. Yeah. And it would, that 10 million that would be left in the bond would be all infrastructure monies. So there'd be no devices, no. You know, none, none of those short lifetime, short lifetime but it'd be all long term asset. Um, I could get on board with that. Okay. While we're on that subject, um, t tell me just out of curiosity on, on this ninth grade campus and the overpopulation that John just touched on, how about any some type of rezoning to help ease that at all? Is, is that a viable option? Because I know that the, you know, there's Woodlands High School and College Park are fairly close. Night, the, you know, Conroe's not, so I don't they're, know that it's they're fairly full too. <laughs> I understand. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I'm, I'm not trying to say. No, I'm not belittling what you're saying. I'm just getting around. I mean, is it is is that has that been discussed? Is there any potential for? I mean, we look at any of that at all. Chris is going to share that some options here in the future. Historically, we have not rezoned people out of their high school feeders yeah. as a school district unless we've opened a new school. It's never, it's just not been done. It is, and Chris will talk about all the reasons why, but we know the reasons. It's very disruptive to families, to communities when you change um, where they go to it school. It does matter. And when you think about Conroe, you know, one option would be, you know, can you, could we send some kids from the east side to Caney Creek? The challenge there is Caney Creek's also growing at a very high rate. Yeah, and two years from now, we'll look up and Caney Creek will, We'll be over Correct. there, and then how would we address that? So um, the long-term solution for Conroe 9's rezoning issue and, frankly, Caney Creek's rezoning issue would be the next high school that gets built on our on our site on 336. It's a down-the-road move, but that's the, that is the rezoning option for really to... to Divides it in thirds. Yes. I agree. Okay. Short-term fix to this problem disrupts family. It disrupts education, and it you know, it's, it's not value. moving. It's, it's not moving somebody from one yeah. elementary in a theater zone to another because you're having an overcrowd. Yeah. Yeah. It's changing their whole game. Yeah, when you specifically, you're talking about the disruption of families. You're talking about at the junior high level and above because we do move around elementary schools from time to time. Occasionally, but typically, when we change within, elementaries, you're moving from one elementary to the next, which is is absolutely a change and it affects people greatly and, yes. and it's emotional um but when you change a high school feeder it changes everything and as mr sanders it can affect people buy, buy homes because they want their child to go to a certain high school i, I agree i i'm i'm not belittling yeah. that i'm just saying i, I know that this is tough sometimes we yeah. got to make some tough calls and i just want to make sure that you know one of the things that that another thing that we listen to is just to make sure that we're doing our due diligence to look at everything. Yes. But, but to answer I, know your we, question, I know we are. To but. answer your question, really the only place that we have any, because of the new opening of Grand Oaks, the only place that we have any uh, room would be Oak Ridge, Ninth Grade. Oak Ridge or Oak Ridge, Ninth Grade. And that's only temporary because of that division. You know what I'm saying? It's, don't be short sighted and move them down there because it's coming back to yeah, And I remember you. I'm not you short sighted. I didn't mean that. But, let, but I also know the general. What you shared with me one time before was when you move one school to fill it, you, you move every. You, you, it's, a, it's a puzzle piece. You don't just move one. That's why Dr. Hines affects is brilliant because he can do all, that. all kinds. That's why we're glad he's brilliant. Yeah. Can yeah. yeah. um, I a couple more questions Please. on this? Um, so extension of bond uh, plan from four to five result in additional one new elementary campus. Do we, 
is that the, uh, about the same price as the others we were seeing, like twenty one million? Oh, well, it's it's thirty nine as well. Thirty nine. So the the escalation of cost currently uh, is a six percent inflation in the construction world, which is a lot. We understand that it's not by our choice. Okay. Um, right. We are beholden to the state of Texas procurement laws. We're beholden to local jurisdictions and the expectations they put on us. And then we are beholden to the market. Uh, as we know, just a few months ago, SciFair passed $1.8 billion worth of work. Uh, Fort Bend has passed $900 million worth of work. Mm -hmm. Humble, $500 million. Uh, we expect that HISD will likely bring uh, two two billion dollars worth of work soon. So the market is yeah. tough. Um, now, one of the things that I would point out here is, so we're not we have not changed our building. All right. So Footprint, the right. the same building that we built as part of the 2015 bond is what we will build as part of the 2019 bond. We have not gone in. There'll be minor security updates as we've changed our security, but that that does not significantly impact the price of the building. Um, <coughs> Now, if so, we're having to, to guess out five years from now, like on that last elementary to be built, be built five years from now. So we're, we are guessing if it works out where, where we have currently in the package um, 39.4 million for that school, if we're able to build that building for $34 million, we just won't sell that five million dollars worth of bonds. Sure. So it, it'll just be debt that we will never incur. Right. Um, and we will work to do that. Obviously, Understood. Get the best deal that we can. Okay. If you remember back to Houston ISD's last bond, you will remember that they underestimated the costs of many of their projects, and escalation, you know, caught up with them. So they, as they neared the last year or two of their bond. They were out of funds and could not build the um, all of the assets that they had promised the community that they were going to build, which created a lot of upheaval. And so while we try to be as close to exact as we can on these numbers, it's true that we don't want to be short in these numbers because it is it is much easier for us to not sell the bond right. for the full amount than it would be to come up $2 million short and have to find the $2 million to sure. get the project built. Gotcha. But My last... You know, I'm sorry. My last, okay. my last question, real quick. Is it on this subject? I'll, okay. I'll yield to you, John. Nope. Okay. My last question is um, no tax rate increase. So the 28 2019 tax rates at the dollar 28. The proposed 2019 2020 is at the dollar 235. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So I want to make sure I understand when we say no tax rate increase, if we adopt this tax rate of dollar 235. We're talking about from that tax rate, correct. not from correct. the dollar twenty-eight. Yeah, correct. you are correct, sir. Okay, thank you. That's all I got, Mr. Husband. I was just going to say, extending. You know, there is. It's not by accident that we've done four-year bonds in the past. Um, when when you plan out four years, some people would argue even past three, be it dem demographic, be it construction cost, be it whatever, you're asking for it anyway. And if the elementary is the, I mean, if, if we're dividing everything by five to get the tax rate at zero, um, all, I, all I'm saying to you is we're just, we're just begging for bigger concerns as we stretch the bond from four to five years. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying go into it with eyes wide open because... If you don't think construction is going to be more expensive next year than this year and five times is more expensive than the next year, or not five times, but five more increases come along, then then you're being short sighted. Okay? And it's, I, I don't know what we're planning on that fifth year elementary being or whenever we sell those bonds to build that, okay? But I promise you it's going to be way more expensive than this, as everything else always is and always has been. When it comes to construction and inflation, and it's a, and what the one exception of that was when our economy cratered in two thousand and eight, we stretched a four year bond into three into seven, yeah. uh, stretched it by three years, but that is not likely to happen again. I certainly hope not. Okay, but um, I think that's reflected in the draft here. 
And to, to be fair, we, as we, <clears throat> we're sharpening our pencil on every single project that's in this package. Every number's been touched and looked at to make sure that, that we have addressed it. We did go back and consider uh, could we do a 5% escalation in construction costs for these schools instead of six um, to save that money? In the end, it was not worth the risk. If we could show a lower number here, but we could find ourselves at the end being short. We show a larger number here now, but once again, if we can build it cheaper, we won't sell those bonds and we come out and it's a savings uh, that way. So we, we did consider those options, but we chose to be what I consider to be more conservative and protect the future uh, building those schools. <clears throat> I'm just I'm sure. well, <clears throat> cost of construction is increasing and so on and so forth. I just I mean it isn't by accident that we we limited those bond terms. Right. And uh, stretching it might be convenient, but is it in the in in the end run is it is it is it beneficial? Dr. No, I think you guys, you and team did an outstanding job. Reach out. One more quick question, if you don't mind. The, the phase two of Conroe High School, yes, sir. which is where we're, we're headed to, um, did that include decommissioning and tearing down buildings? It does. Yes. It does. And so in putting that back up, the, the, uh, they're going to have a smaller footprint for their practice fields, correct? Yes. So... Is is turf for them still included in that phase two, or are we talking about not? If, if by chance we do the suggestion of having turf in a different lawn, would that mean for all turf proposed everywhere, or would that would would Conroe High School still get there? There's actually two projects that are going to require a turf field conversion. So Conroe High School is one of those. Just as you had mentioned, their practice field footprint's going to shrink <coughs> in order to facilitate having a campus that's all in a one room. So we're going to need a practice field that is turf because of the utilization of the other. Right. The three that are there now handle the, the traffic pretty well. But when you move down to two, you increase that traffic. There'll be nothing but dirt within the first three weeks of school. Yeah, okay. So a turf conversion for what is now the JV field at Connor High School mm -hmm. is what we've got in that, in that phase so two plan. Really sure. needs to be. So the other project is the new junior high in the Grangerland and Kenny Creek Peter Zone. <coughs> because water. That's because we generate our own utilities there. So water. we own the water service. So in order to make sure we have enough water for all of those campuses on our well system, we need to reduce the burden. Got it. So in order to do that, we okay. picked up the football field for Kenny Creek as part of that junior high school upgrade. So when we build a junior high school new, well, that project would facilitate converting right, the King Creek football field. To I, I just want to make sure in the conversation that those those two projects would still move forward. Yeah, they, they are in what would be Proposition A. They're not in Proposition B. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. So just to summarize, and I want to make sure that I've, I've heard you so that we know what we're working on moving forward, but we will consider uh, how to work the Conroe High School ninth grade campus addition back into the the plan uh, and then looking at the potential of utilization of $10 million in fund balance to help uh, offset that cost and um, keep us uh, at the no tax rate increase uh, moving forward package. So we, we will do that um, and we will bring that back one more time August 6th for you know any additional feedback you may have um, looking ahead. Okay. Yes, I have good. one more question. And this is kind of a simplistic approach, mm -hmm. but I'm understanding what mm -hmm. you and John were talking about, about this 6% mm -hmm. increase in construction costs. So if someone said, well, why can't we just put the bond off until next year? Is that <coughs> very simplistic, simplistically, you could, but you would be, if I'm calculating right, 6% is around 40 million. So you would be asking public for... 700 million for the same, same thing. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's time is of the essence to Correct. try to do that. Yes, yeah. you got security in there too. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. gotta get that stuff. But more of a mission ship. Okay. Yes, sir. Dr. No, without yes, really, uh, I'm, I'm gonna ask you your opinion. Okay. <laughs> but based on the community feedback that you've gotten recently, where do you anticipate the community is at? Uh, I, I think because I think there's been, and the reason I'm asking mm -hmm. that question to give you a little bit more time 
is we've talked about a no tax increase. We originally we had in there the 807 that didn't pass because of the amount, the different items, different things. I'm just trying to get an idea based on your new proposal. What do you think, or what is? Have you had conversations? Mm -hmm. That, yeah. Okay. If but you based have, on what are, you know, what are your what are your thoughts? About? Based on you know early runs of this that we have shared with some community members to, to get feedback to help us build this to bring forward to you, um, the reception has been very positive. I think when you look at what was shared as major concerns, <laughs> the overall amount was a was a big one. It's been reduced. The amount of maintenance in the bond was a large concern. It's been significantly re reduced. Um, we are still meeting the needs of, of all the student classrooms. Uh, we've extended the life of the bond and to do those things and come back with no tax rate increase. has All of those things have been very well received by community members that, that I've spoken with. Um, it's hard to know, you know for sure what the, uh, the feeling is out there, but um, everything I've heard has been positive based on the plan that they've seen. Um, and, I, and the secondary feedback from that is people have communicated to me that they feel like we've listened to their concerns and we've, we've addressed them. I think that's forward. important. I think you have done a good job of that. Mm -hmm. I think even knowing now what we know about uh, having to have full day yes. uh, pre-K, uh, we know what that's going to do to us uh, just from a, from a capacity standpoint. Mm -hmm. I guess that was a big part to going ahead and adding back the elementary school yeah, the, because we're going to have the need for that. Yeah, the ability to take this package, and this, and this is a testament to Mr. Foster and Darren and Chris and Sarah uh, and Mr. Caker, the work that's been done to take this from a four to five year package, add an additional elementary, because remember when we were discussing the $807 million bond, when it went to the voters, we didn't have the mandate for full day pre-K yet. So that's been added to us since then. So to add those elementary seats to help us accommodate that um, and still hit all of the safety and security needs and actually invest more in safety and security this time um, than we had and bring in the lower overall amount and no tax rate increase, I think is a, um, a big effort. I agree, thank you. Well, I have one question. Okay. Since this is a five-year bond now, and we have six years to implement, and we're talking about building one elementary in one theater zone. How exactly are we going to address how many preschool children we have now uh -huh. doubling, even if we don't get an extra soul because they're going to be there all day now? That's a double, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then, so wherever you implement it over the next six years, we're going to have one year besides this bond package. To fix that problem? But we think we can fix it sooner. I'll let Chris talk about the. Okay. We'll try. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll brilliant, Dr. Hines. We're gonna I, land I it like down. that brilliant yeah. Hines. Uh -huh. I like that. Yeah, we we uh, there's some things we do not have a plan for. There's some things we are planning for, uh, and it's a very fluid. And uh, and John, you might have said it, it, it. It's hard to plan too far out because things keep changing and shifting. And so that's always a concern when we, uh, and why when we do rezoning, we always try to hold off as long as we can because things change. We see changes in patterns. And so something that might be uh, causing concern might stop or something new might start. So that's why we try to uh, look at it very deliberately and slowly. And so if I can, can I just jump in here real sure. fast before Chris starts? So. I'm trying to transition here a little bit from the, the plan of the bond program and Chris is going to talk a little more about what are the impacts specifically if the bond is not successful. Uh, it's a question that was asked multiple times through the last um, bond election. The reality of the May bond election is that we had this opportunity here in November. Um, as we forecast out, if this were not to be a successful election, I'm not sure that November of 20 is an option for another election based on if we do a lot of rezoning, we create a lot of turmoil in the community. So it could be as far out as November of 21 before we could have that consideration. And that will mean um, education for every child in the school district will be affected. 
Good. Okay. And the the um, ability of every teacher in the school district to teach will be affected if that occurs, because we will be using um, what the state gives us in M and O funding, which is intended to educate children on a daily basis. We will be using that money to um, finance capital projects that will will be needed and necessary to keep our buildings running. So um, there will be an impact far and wide. It is not what we want. Uh, I want to make that clear. What we're going to share here is not what we suggest. Um, we do not feel it's in the best interest of children or the best, the best interest of education. However, it's just a reality that we have to plan for every scenario. And so Chris is going to talk us through that. Um, but I want to make it clear, this is not what we recommend as what we want to do. This would be if we are forced to make these decisions, he's going to show some plans that we, we may have to implement to do that. All right. <clears throat> As Dr. Noel was saying, I'll, I'll start with just a reminder. We know we're growing, um, and, and as we've seen in the past, sometimes we grow faster than we think, sometimes we grow slower than we think, but we do grow. And uh, it's these are just some of the, uh, what we call the hot spot maps, and just reminding ourselves of where we're seeing growth and which part of the districts, uh, which part of the district that we have it. So as we start to plan, and we've been, certainly we look at planning all the time that one we know we're going to continue to grow uh, we're going to have to continue to manage crowding at campuses that's not going to go away we will continue to plan in the event that you choose to call for the spawn <coughs> referendum we will plan both for the possibility that it is successful is that there's planning if that happens and it's certainly we have to plan if it's not successful um, and then we're also having to think about what is the plan in the immediate future because there's certain things that we know we want to do for next year the, the 2021 year that if we have to start in the 1920 year uh, to get there so these are just some of those those topics and things that we look at um, and, and I want to kind of point out and try to capture some of those things that we know that are looming out there that we want to do safety and security is a good one um, we still want to work on our projects we still have a lot of work to do in that area so this is an area we would be looking for money if um, we were not successful with a bond issue uh, also, we know we'll have campus infrastructure work to do, right? Chillers break, roofs need to be maintained. These things will happen regardless of whether we have a bond or whether we pass it. Or if, if we don't pass it, we know we're going to have to plan for it. We know we have to do some technology replacement. We have aging equipment, so that's, that's an ongoing cyclical uh, plan. Uh, we know that we'll have to add portable buildings for growth. We know we have that. We've talked about pre-K, but there's generally growth going on at almost 1400 students a year um, we also have a fleet of current portables we have 175 that we'll be putting into use this year uh, that also require maintenance and repair and they're they're aging um, we know we'll have to order buses again for the following year uh, that we usually order those in the spring and then certainly we have to start planning for these projects so that we are ready uh, when they go uh, we don't we don't want to get to where we pass a bond and then we have to start the process we need to be ready in terms of the design so there is a need for uh, about 25 million dollars in identified uh, costs to go forward from this year to get ready for the 2021 year and we certainly wanted to can give you some things to consider as possible ways to fund those things um, going forward uh, certainly one we could we could manage some funds from uh, salaries um, the retention stipend, we have roughly a $5 million placeholder there. Um, the, uh, we could do something with our allocation or hiring freezes uh, to, to try to come up with some money there. Uh, we could do a general expense reduction. $2 million represents about 9.5% of our supply budget. Um, and then another option is a one cent tax rate increase, which is a weighted penny, I believe. And, um, when you say minimum salary increase, I don't see that. I mean, I don't see minimum being an option. What, what, what does that mean, minimum? Is it 1%, 2%? That's, a, that's about a 1% increase so yeah. across the board. Okay. So if I zero that out, that'd be what saving? If it was, if it was zero, a to, total of $10 million. $10 million? Mm -hmm. And then the uh, I got it. And then the reallocation, we would start to use money from the capital maintenance budget. 
uh, that you've already set up. Uh, and, that, that move, and that number could be bigger if you so choose. So if you wanted to, to not do the salary or mess with the salary, you could. What about the increase in the uh, radius of bus pickup for transportation? Has that been given an option? Yeah, we've certainly looked at that. Um, there is savings to be made in terms of, uh, again, extending that bus uh, radius. Uh, what, what we would, what we caution against is we have some really bad traffic around our schools, oh, yeah. and so um, that's one of those unanticipated consequences. If we continue to go out, we may create even more unmanageable traffic yeah. around some of our campuses, um, and and certainly um, it it is a balancing act. Transportation is probably one of the most, uh, when we did the one mile, that was a very painful threshold. Um, so there is a savings though we go up about every quarter of a mile. I understand. What about exemptions from classroom quota? In terms of the class size waivers is another one. Waivers, yes sir. Mm -hmm. And I, I understand you as educators y'all put that at the end, but you know, when you start cutting budget on, on the smallest item that we have, and that's supplies, yeah. I mean, you know, you're, that's like, like a garden hose on a forest fire. It, it's, you got to get to where it counts. Yes, sir. Yes. You know, I think, I think we need to be a bit about the business of explaining what 26 to 1 versus 22 to 1 does. I mean, it, it you know. I understand carrots, but uh, uh, you know, I think, I think the truth needs to be out there. Class size ratio is a way to manage a lack of space, and you know, it's certainly something that we look at. And I'll use intermediate school as the example. So we currently staff intermediate is not twenty two to one; it's twenty six to one. Um, but to drop it even to to twenty five to one would require seventeen additional classrooms. Uh, and you can see going the other way reduces the demand on classrooms. So um, class size is one of those uh, factors. Uh, the other, another factor that certainly is impacted is, is changing programs. So we've talked about pre-K going from a half a day to a full day. We did the same thing with kindergarten about 10 years ago where we took it from a half day program to an entire day program. In both cases, what we're doing is not expanding the capacity of a building, we're actually decreasing the capacity of the building because we're now able to serve um, fewer students because of the way we're using those classrooms. And certainly, you know, I wanted to, to just mention that about space. It fluctuates. Uh, we have special programs, and I'll use an example. We could have a, we have a school that I visited the other day that has two life skills unit and a, um, a physical lab, uh, a motor skills lab. So there's three classrooms tied up, and they're serving a total of about 12 students. And so that that is space that we have to have and we need it to serve our students. But when you're looking at just a number of rooms and you run a calculation, you think this building can hold this many, well, you have to start allowing for special programs. And we have special programs in our schools and all of our schools. Uh, in addition, we have rooms that are outfitted with special equipment. Um, and I you know, use the example of a welding lab. If the welding lab is open for a period, we're not gonna send an English class into the welding lab. We don't need them welding their books together, so. Um, so we try to look at those kinds of things. So capacity is a moving target and it fluctuates. Uh, and it's one that, you know, I know it's frustrating for you as board members when you hear us say, we go up, we go down, but we're actually losing capacity in all of our elementary schools with all day pre-K just because we know we're gonna continue. What's frustrating to me as a board member is to have the public misunderstand or people in the public argue that we're not going by 13 to 14 to 1700 kids a year when that is a proven fact and there's a line to show it and I've got the graph, and yet you're, I don't think they comprehend what 26 kids in an elementary classroom would be. I, I'm not advocating this, Phillips. I promise you I'm not advocating. But if they can't understand that we're growing by this many people and we have, need this many schools, how are they going to understand 26 to 1 versus 22 to 1? Because as a general rule, that's not a big change in number, you know, but it's a big change in that classroom. It's a big change in the classroom. A big change. And I, and I just say it's high time we, we educated them to the facts, okay? Yes, we are growing, and yes, we're going to have to do something about it, okay? 
I don't want any kids under the shade tree trying to learn. I, I think that, that point's been made that uh, initially that we need to do a better job of communicating this. I mean, we're going to propose another bond in November. It has to be understood of if the bond doesn't pass, this is what we're faced with. I mean, it just is what it is because otherwise you look at it as, why, why would I vote for that, you know? Uh, so this is, and, and this is what comes about when we don't get the uh, funding needed in order for the district to have the resources it needs to be successful. So we need to do a better job, as you mentioned before, of communicating this. Well, I think um, one of the reasons we, I'm just kind of speaking out loud here, but I think one of the reasons we may have held back on this is what could happen is because we certainly didn't want to come across as a threat. You know, hey, if this bond doesn't pass, you know, we're going to hold you hostage because this is what we're going to do. <laughs> You know, we, we we knew a lot of this information, but out of respect to the voters and trying to do our very best to to provide them with information and make decisions versus, versus trying to scare, you know, we, we saw that. We saw a lot of that. We saw a lot of that scare tactics crap, and uh, we're not about that. So a lot of this information, you know, people could have come to that conclusion, but we wanted to respect the voters and their ability to make decisions based on what was going to happen but now it's not a threat by any stretch of the imagination if we don't address the growth in the community in a prudent way well here you go yeah this is what's going to happen fair i mean is that a yes yeah absolutely and that was part of that feedback that we got from the community was you need to tell people exactly what the the ramifications would be so that they understand that and they'll make their choice moving forward mm -hmm. um what we were sensitive to and what we would we don't want to do is surprise the community so you know to not share this now and then come back in december and say here are all right. the, what we have to do to respond to make sure that a the current buildings that we have stay functional and b that we find some way to accommodate these new students coming in um, this is what it's going to take. And what we're, the numbers that Chris showed were year one numbers. The reality is they're a little, it's a little far out, so we didn't show you year two numbers. But if we don't go back out to the voters until November of 21, for example, there'd be a year two, which by everything we've seen is going to be significantly larger than year one. Um, you know, so year one is 25, year two may be 35 or 40. So. <clears throat> Go ahead, Chris. Um, we, and I'll just mention core facilities sometimes plays another factor. Um, so we can sometimes we do add on to buildings, but at some point we're limited by traffic, parking, restrooms, cafeteria sizes, and so on. Uh, we, we do have and we try to respond in many ways, and certainly uh, dealing with waivers or class size is one, adding on to campuses allowing transfers, building new campuses, re relocating special programs. We do look at that. And then rezoning and then using portable classrooms. As you know, we, we, we do do attendance boundary work. And we do it from time to time. It usually is because we're growing. Uh, we have to do it when we open up a new school. We've also had to do it when we've looked and seen that we've had schools that are underutilized. Um, we've also had to look because we've seen changes in the way uh, we have density, and we've had changes. We've had some areas where we've had rapid growth, and there wasn't one new building built. And where did they come from? Well, it just changed the way uh, we suddenly started pulling many, many children out of an apartment complex where we used to get hardly anybody. So there was just a change in the way um, that community, uh, that, that apartment community was. And so we've seen that, um, and we have to be ready for that. We've seen areas that mature, they, they grow, they get big, they get older. They drop off, and we've seen some areas that are older that turn over with younger families with children, and they start growing again. So we try to look at all of those. Um, and even though it is necessary as we open new schools to, and as we work to reduce our dependence on portable classrooms, uh, rezoning is probably one of the most <coughs> difficult things that we do as a district. Um, as Dr. Noel mentioned, changing schools can be disruptive to our families and to their patterns and, of interactions and care. Um, schools are communities, and when we change their schools, we're changing their, their community, and so we, we hear about it. Uh, so it's something we've looked at very carefully. Um, we have done very uh, 
very few changes with high schools, with the exception when we opened Grand Oaks. Uh, before that, the Woodlands and College Park, uh, but when we split the Woodlands, uh, since then we've done virtually nothing. We have moved the academy that was once at Oak Ridge to College Park to make room for students at Oak Ridge at the time. Uh, so we've moved special programs. That's an example of moving a special program. <laughs> But we've, we've tried to not do much in terms of disrupting uh, the zones. Uh, it is something that we must do as a result of growth, but we do try to minimize it. Um, and then as I mentioned earlier, that's something that we've learned over time is that there are changes in demographic patterns. And so we're always cautious about jumping out too fast to make a move. We tend to watch, we tend to wait, to make sure the pattern is holding before we do something. Um, we also have tried to be uh, future forward thinking, and I'll use the example of when we did, we built uh, Broadway, we built Burnham Woods, and then we built Snyder. And they're very close together, and there's a lot of growth in that area. And what we tried to do along the way was anticipate who was going to get moved in the next school, so we tried not to move them every couple years. And so we try to do that, we try to look out, so we can give <clears throat> some continuity to families. It's not always possible, but we try. Um, and so I also mentioned, I'll just remind you that um, if and when you ever see a building that you think is underutilized, worry not. We have lots of need for space in our district. So uh, we, we always are having a need for itinerant staff. And so we, we office people, we move them around. Uh, for example, this is what we had last year. We had uh, out at Caney Creek High School, we had a special uh, vocational program. We had storage for special education records. We had OT, occupational therapy, and physical therapy equipment storage out there. We had two VAC adjustment classes and community-based vocation instructional teachers, as well as four deaf education interpreters at Oak Ridge High School. We had 10 homebound teachers that are using one of the portables there. Um, at Wilkinson, we have uh, several staff members at Wilkinson Elementary. Eventually, we're going to need those seats as we see... Um, the uh, area that used to be Camp Straight grow. Um, so we're also um, have 10 occupational and physical therapists that are working out of Ford. Um, and Derrickson and Houston each have a PPCD uh, testing lab. So uh, we try to use space as we have, and I just want you to know that, that we don't, just because if the school looks underutilized, it doesn't mean we don't have things going on in those classrooms. And for this coming year, for the 1920 year, um, what we have to look forward to is we're in, we know we're going to be rezoning for uh, Stockton Junior High School, which will open, open a year from now. And so we'll be doing the rezoning this year. This is going to impact our Pete and Washington attendance boundaries. And we're also going to be looking at some solutions for Ride and Glenlock Elementary Schools this year. Um, Ride, which is uh, <coughs> capacity of 575, is projected at 752. They currently have 12 portable classrooms. Glenlock, which has a capacity of 575, is projected at 706 students. They have five portables. Um, I made a note, they are 585 without their bilingual program. So we certainly know that moving the program is also an option for creating capacity at that campus. Um, and we know it, in those particular two cases, we know that the solutions lie in the Woodlands area. We have some capacity at some Woodlands Elementary schools, and we, we tend to take advantage of it. And just to show you how that goes full circle, Ten years ago, it was ride that was empty. Yes, it not was. empty, but you know, yes, it was. underutilized. And here we were building these other schools, and there was a shift. There, there absolutely was, yes, sir. And then here we go filling. You know, the neighborhood turns over, and here we go filling it back. There's no such thing as 100. percent I mean, it, it just doesn't happen perfectly. It's 110 or 90 or 94 exactly. or whatever it is. It it never works out exactly like you said. Uh, Hard to, hard to have English in the welding lab. Uh, that's pretty good. The, um, now, beyond that, so we have some immediate plans for this coming year to address some things. Beyond that, just I'm going to hit some of the highlights of some of these areas. And these are mostly the campuses that are going to be impacted directly by uh, the bond issue. And uh, Grangerland Interme Intermediate is a campus with a capacity of 1,100. We added on to it recently. They're currently uh, projected at 1,213 this year with seven portable classrooms. By 2021, they're projected to have 1,254 students. And no um, room for additional portable. And no, it's very limited. Yes, sir. Very limited. I mean, you're going to have to cross the street. If that's even. It's, there's, there's a possibility for a couple more there, but it's tight. Yes, sir. It's very tight. 
And that's one of those, certainly, if we build an elementary school, and I want to point this out about um, the solution for um, if we pass a bond building a new junior high, we're about three years out. So no matter what, we've got to make it about three years with Moorhead and Granger land regardless. Obviously, if we're not successful, that's a much bigger problem. We're going to change the way we're looking at solving that problem. But, but at the very least, we're still looking for a three-year solution. And there's a lot of possibilities with that that we have to look at, and, and there are many options. But I won't go through all of them, but certainly that's something that we are looking at. Stewart Elementary is another one that's on our radar. It's a K-6 through school. It has a capacity of 975. They are projected at 962 this year. Um, by 2023... It is projected to have more than 1,600 students. Um, so certainly that's when we don't have a contingency plan because one of the schools in the bond is to build a school on the west side of the, the district. And that, that 975 already includes that last wing of that school, mm -hmm. right? Yes, sir. I mean, I mean, yeah, we built In other words, out. the proverbial, we've already added on. We did, right? yeah. yes, sir. Okay. All right. I'm just making sure. And that is a very tight site. That is one that is a very tight site in terms of our options. So, you know, if we bring in a couple of portables, we're probably going to lose parking spaces. We just know that. Um, by 2023, um, that one's going to be really tight. Giesinger is one we're, we're certainly watching. We have a capacity of 675. We're projected at 779 this year. We have six portable classrooms there. In 2023, we're looking at over 1,000 students. Now, again, we know Giesinger's growing. We know Stewart's growing. And guess what we were going to use to fill up the third, the new school? So Giesinger would provide some of the students and Stuart would provide some of the students, which is why in the past we've kind of let them overflow because we know it makes it easier to split when we do the new school. If we don't have a school coming, it changes the way we think about this problem. And certainly we'll have to look at some other solutions that may not be as uh, pretty and they may not be long-term. Snyder, uh, which has a capacity of 1,000, is projected at 1088 this year and in four years it being at 1200 broadway is the other one we're worried about in the grand oaks area and that that area is still growing we've seen a very rapid growth in harmony this summer as well as uh woodson's reserve so we're really keeping an eye on it um, broadway is projected at 1054 they'll have two portables this year we think they're going to go over that um, and they're projected to be at 1282 in four years. And that's one of the elementaries that's in that, that bond package as well. Um, and certainly something we'll have to look at. And that would involve, again, going backwards probably and going, you know, moving students maybe back towards Ford and then moving students from Ford back towards Hauser and Oak Ridge Elementary to try to solve for that. So we're certainly going to look at different options. Um, Austin. Elementary, as we know, is full and filling up, and that, again, is a school that would be served by the first school that would be in that bond, which would be the elementary in the, um, the Granger Pines area. I think I understand, but can you tell me, we just got through rebuilding Austin. Just got, I just got it. it's still being, having brick put on it. Yes. And we've got, and we're starting out, it's, it's kind of like Kaufman. We're starting off with six portables. We are, we, Austin is rebuilt to its, capacity it was before we did not expand any capacity there but, but why wouldn't I, I i think i'm asking why wouldn't we okay why would we not put a whole nother wing because of administrative in a elementary is small it can only hold so much well, 900 is pretty much max we've talked about the infrastructure the driveway the 105 traffic uh, all these were factors and looking at it and it's a tight site we were really working around trying to make it work and so i understand but i, I just want to make sure because it, it seems ridiculous to be sitting there working on it and and be setting up the portables in the brand new driveway i mean it just it, it, there's something inherently so, so but we do plan to rezone austin with the new elementary to bring down the class size and so that is something that's part of again we we anticipate it to shrink in the future we are going to be over for the short term until we have a solution, uh, but that is a rapidly growing area. And we did talk about doing a two-story addition and doing some other things, uh, but it just... It, to John's point, I mean, I, it does, I mean, efficiency-wise, I mean, we're anticipating having almost a brand new school and then we're going to roll out it, some portables at the same time. But did you hear him? That there, there's one principal, one, you know, maybe one or two at most of uh, assistant principals and one counselor and one nurse. 
And when you go to making it the size of an intermediate school or bigger, okay, the, the, the core just can't, the core of people and the core of restrooms and the core of uh, a cafeteria can't handle it. It's, it's a tight site. And it, even though, even in, in, in leaving it the same size, leaving it the same size anticipated re-diversifying that population, uh, re rezoning that po part of that population, right? Yes, sir. And, and, and just for the record, we're not bringing just, any new portables in yet. We, those are the ones that are already there. <laughs> 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 but we may have to add some before it's all yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, I just noticed there was some in the brand yeah, right. new on the brand new concrete yeah. out there. I was going, yeah, we're, wow. We're gonna yeah. keep we're gonna keep growing. It's a, it's a rapidly growing area if you haven't been out there, and it's well, certainly one. When we open but that's Kaufman, also part of our need for the new choice. elementary. When we opened Kaufman, we gave them the choice. I mean, y'all can either split or stay the same neighborhood and open with portables. They elected to open with. They did. So I mean, I understand that it I have it's still confusing to those right. simple-minded people like me. Another school that we're certainly keeping an eye on is Bush. Uh, it's a capacity of 825, uh, or projected at 825, and we are looking at 1062 by 2023. Um, we actually have a plan. That's one that we're we're, we're certainly looking at Bucklew Elementary, and we kind of plan for for that overflow at that point. So that is one that we feel like we can handle with the existing capacity. Lamar Elementary was one that we're keeping an eye on. It's projected at 820 this year with five portables. And we just rezoned that area. And um, we're going to keep watching it very carefully. And then uh, we can make adjustments based on what we see. But we probably need to watch that for a did year. Did you just take a program there? We did put a program there. So uh, what we did is we took a, an area, we reduced their um, attendance zone, and we brought the students that live in the zone but that take bilingual back. So it's about a trade, but we're going to keep watching it. And, and Glenlock is overcrowded anyway, so we, right. you know, I understand. It's... Junior highs, uh, we're trying to, to certainly manage the junior high growth. As we mentioned, we do have a plan for Conroe. I think the, the bigger challenge that we start to think about are the, the two that I mentioned, Moorhead and York. Um, you know, we... Something that we do have to keep in mind, we will have a little bit of capacity in Conroe when we open Stockton, um, overall number of seats, but we're projected to fill them up in the next five or six years. So that's one of those things where if we do use those seats, we know that it's a temporary use and we'll have to find it's not a long-term solution. Uh, More, Moorhead Junior High School, which has a capacity of 1,050, is projected at 1,168 for this coming year. Um, and it's projected at 1447 for the 22-23 year. We currently have seven portables on site. Uh, and I know Mr. Colshan's been certainly looking at some different solutions and whether or not there's a possibility of moving, you know, a few students over to the high school main campus or certainly rezoning is another one that we're looking at. Um, I, I made a note earlier, a successful bond this November means three years before we have a new campus, likely. So... We'll have to make plans to make do in the in the short term. Uh, so we're looking at those possible solutions. And then York is the other one that we have some issues with. Obviously, if we can build a new wing there, we have a solution coming. Uh, we're projected at 1608 this year with 14 portables. And 14 portables are probably a few more than they actually need. We've loaded them up because they're growing about 100 a year. So uh, they should have almost enough for next year as well. Tell them stop, stop growing in that area. Yeah. They're projected at 1835 for 2023, 24 year. This is just a sample, you know, in terms, terms of looking at solutions. And again, this isn't necessarily anything that's um, been, you know, ironed out that we say yeah, this is definitely our plan. But this is, for example, a plan uh, that takes an area that is north of 105, that this is laid on top of our current attendance boundaries for Pete in Washington. This isn't what the Suchma Pete boundaries will look like. We know there'll be adjustments when we when we redraw those. But this this new section, the section that's in red, uh, if we brought it over to Suchma, that Stockton. would Stockton. Stockton. I'm sorry, my fault. Stockton. That would reduce um, <clears throat> that would reduce roughly about 150 students uh, at Moorhead. Okay, but let's be clear. We haven't voted on the Stockton. No. I mean, no, no, just because no, that's Washington's boundaries doesn't mean that's That's correct. Stockton. I just don't have the Stockton one to show you. Well, what, what I'm saying is, 
Don't want anybody to think that's already been decided. Correct. Right. Because right. that's not the line. That's not the line. That's the if Washington line. Exactly that's the line. What's I don't know, but but it's not the Stockton line. Uh, this is another example of a Moorhead potential solution. This one is going down the 242 corridor and bringing students from Moorhead Junior High School to Irons Junior High School. And so uh, this one is a different, coming at it from a different angle as a possible solution. And again, it's not a long-term solution because there's a large development going in off yeah. 242 that would overwhelm Irons within a few years. So. This is not, and again, neither one of these that I show you is not a long-term solution. These are short-term uh, types of options to look at. This is another solution. It's not a Moorhead solution. This is a solution for perhaps York. Uh, and if nothing else changes, this is currently a look at the map of Irons is in blue, Knox is in the beige color, and McCullough's in the green, and uh, York is in the orange. Uh, that little area, the little neighborhood that you see that's in the beige that would go to uh, Knox under this potential plan is um, Legends Ranch area. So it's roughly about 100 students in grade level. So that represents about 200 students that would, could move to Knox. Where do they go right now? They go to York. <laughs> uh, the, to make room at Knox for 200 students, you can see up yeah, on the... Would, let's wait till I retire. So would they... Go, would okay. they <laughs> I don't want to be here that I'm just <laughs> Again, these are just options. I just want to make sure... I, uh, I, I, uh, but but, but that, to, make, they're, they're, to make room at Knox for Legends Ranch students, we would take the Harper's Landing, which is up uh, top above 242, um, and they would go to Irons. And that's roughly almost a trade. There's a difference of about 20 or 30 students. And then eventually to Oak Ridge? Well, I'll get into high schools we next. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm talking about the Harbors Landing people because they can really go to it's college. Certainly it's an option. So, so again, look at the high school options that we've been kind of keeping an eye on. Uh, certainly... Uh, the Woodlands High School main campus is one that we've been watching, College Park, and as you talked about earlier, the Conroe 9. So I, I think you, you've talked about that. And I made a note, we're watching Conroe 9. That's one of those regardless of the bond issue because it's a, but now if we move that project in there, there will be some additional ca yeah. classroom space. Again, I would point out that only gets us time. It's not a 10-year solution adding on to that campus, but it certainly buys us time. And that's really what a, a lot of this is, is over time we get a clearer picture of what we want to do next. Th this is a, uh, a, a draft of, and then certainly this is our current boundaries. So I don't, we probably shouldn't put draft on this one, but I, we, but Sarah was stamping away. So uh, <laughs> but this one is a, uh, this is our current boundary. It's really not a draft. Um, and again, I kind of, the beige color that goes to College Park on the east side of the freeway is Harper's Landing neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and then I will, what you'll say, what's different? This is, a, this is one possible scenario that we looked at that produced some, um, some pretty good numbers in terms of reducing. The net effect on this one is it reduces the Woodlands, almost 200 students, reduces College Park, roughly 200 students, and adds about 400 students to Oak Ridge attendance boundary, which... Uh, is a pretty good number for them. Um, and, you know, the changes, I'll just highlight a few of the changes. It, up in the A74, the Stillwater area, uh, there's an area along 242, which is um, Windsor Hills area and um, Windale that, that currently is in the woodlands. The Timber Lakes Timber Ridge area, which is 70A, uh, moves from College Park to the Woodlands, but Carriage Hills moves from the Woodlands to College Park on the top side, so you can kind of see um, that movement. So it kind of cleans up uh, everything on the west side of Old Conroe Road and uh, moves over. So this is one scenario that achieves some some pretty good numbers. Um, that area, go back for a second. That area 83, uh, roughly how many how many do you have over there? 83. Number eight through top left up there off Old Connor Road. Oh, yeah. up there. I do have that. Because that's a growing community, that's too. Foster's, it's growing. That's Foster's, Foster's Ridge. Ridge. That's what I was talking about with Bush. We know that's mm -hmm. growing. Mm -hmm. And that's actually one of the things that's really 
I think it's important to leave it on the woodland side because it's one of the few parts on the woodland side that's still growing. Yep. And we know there are other parts are aging, so it gives some good balance uh, in the future. Uh, but it's certainly one that um, that we've looked at. But that is... Uh, Do we have any potential lawsuits for all those signs up in that A74 that say they're going to the woodland? Have any potential law, lawsuits coming? I don't know. What they spent on signing? There's a lot of signs up there. Yes. Lots of them. Yep. Um, so A74... Or is that the one you were asking? Yeah, still water. Eighty three is the Foster Ridge. How many in eighty three? And are there any roads that are connecting to Conroe yet in that area, that old Conroe Road or around Loop three thirty six? The city of Conroe has a capital improvement plan in place that connects yep. Conroe Old Conroe Road across. That'll be two thousand thirty two. It's, it's growing. You know, it's growing. I don't. Hey, I don't have the eighty. Let us in, John. Let us in. <laughs> I don't have any control. Of the, don't, have, Mr. Uber. I don't have the eighty three. Yep, it. It's plan. growing. I, I could get it on the computer, but I, I don't want to. Say I, it. I was just curious, but you, you you answered my question. Your your the the thought is that's an area of growth that could go towards the woodlands because yes. that's their only area of yeah. of, of growth. And that's fine. It just logistic. The other the other consideration is. The, the way to access that is you have to go to south and where it, inter, it intersects with 1488 is very far to the west there. So while it, it looks like it's the, the development itself looks skewed a little bit to the east when you look at where it connects to 1488, it's it's a little more to the west and it, yeah. it's... It would yeah. work if you could get a, a right of way through that church parking lot. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They would appreciate that. Yeah, I'm sure they'd love it. There is a drive that connects all the way back. And I you put an easy tag in there. They can... <laughs> there go. Um, so that's... That is a high school solution. I did try to reduce it and just give you an idea of the numbers. Um, and this is, and I give you the disclaimer with the little ash at the bottom. This is geocoded enrollment, so this isn't real enrollment. So, for example, at College Park, there's additional students that might be there for the academy, um, special programs or transfers, okay. teachers, children. So these aren't, these aren't the real enrollments. The real enrollments are actually higher. Um, but geocoded, for example, under this plan, the Woodlands would drop to 4255 which is impacting 329 students that would change high school, which is roughly 7% of their students. And, and Dr. Nolan asked me, well, how much is that, you know, what's the impact? And that's roughly, you can extrapolate that through the whole community. It's a 7% impact of attendance of that high school feeder. Um, in College Park, the impact was much greater. It's about 516 students. About 400 moved to Oak Ridge under that, and then another 100 plus go to the Woodlands. And that's an 18% impact to that feeder. So it's significant, almost one in five students um, are impacted. Uh, there's a minor impact with Conroe High because if you, if you didn't notice, we pulled in section 46 um, just to the north of Harper's Landing. Um, and it doesn't produce a lot of students, but that's the Riverbrook area. Mm -hmm. um, and there's 11 students, I think, that were in that area. Um, or 14, I'm sorry. Um, and then Oak Ridge gained roughly 400 students uh, under these, that scenario. So that's just that's another scenario that does equalize it. We currently have 15 portables at the Woodlands High School and I think 12 at College Park. All this would be effective the 21-22 year? It would be effective whenever you wanted it to be effective. So. <laughs> but, but the 20, the, the 19 to it's, 20... It's, uh, yeah. It'd the, it wouldn't. It wouldn't be for 20 this coming 21. year. So twenty twenty one. Twenty to twenty one. Do that. Yes, sir. Twenty twenty one. Thirteen months from now. Fourteen yeah. months from now. Mm -hmm. in November we need to start. Yeah. So this is what the junior high map would look like, and the junior high numbers do work, so that we could keep the junior highs feeder, with the exception of it doesn't solve for York, but it certainly does keep. Uh, we could line up the junior high maps and make it work with the high school maps. And, um, and it, it also produced pretty good numbers. Um, under that one, McCullough drops about 113 students. Uh, Knox drops about 60 students. Um, but you can see the net impact is still about the same percentages as the Woodlands and College Park. Uh, irons would grow, based on different scenarios that we showed you under the San Jacinto scenario, they go right up to 1430, which is right close to capacity, with not much room to grow. As you know, we, with, with uh, Artavia coming online, it wouldn't take long for them to be overflowing, which is a limitation of that plan. Um, and certainly there are other possibilities. We could 
reduce that number from San Jacinto or cut out half. Uh, and then scenario one, that's the one where we uh, did the switch with, uh, we did a switch with Harper's Landing to go um, two irons, they go up to 1352. Um, for Moorhead Junior High, just looking at different solutions, if we, if we brought over some students to Stockton, that would drop them to 1027. But again, that's a temporary solution, I would point out. We would outgrow that space in about three years. Um, and then 1917, if we took that large number to iron. So depending on what we do there. Um, so there's different impacts. They have pros and cons, but certainly I wanted to show those as options that we're considering and then answer any questions that you may have. Wow. That just to be clear, those are not changes that you're recommending. These are not changes that I'm recommending. These are things that we're studying in terms of potential solutions as far as what we do, because we're going to have to have some plans. And as I mentioned, we're going to have to have a plan. If we pass it, we still got to manage our growth. If we don't pass it, it's a different plan. It's going to be a lot more impactful. Um, and then certainly um, we have some work to do just for the schools that are opening, which is Stockton Junior High. So we have some work to do anyway. And Dr. Hines, for the record, I took draft talk. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> there you go. She's on. She's on. Does that in fact clean line from? So the out of curiosity, school? what yes. is the I mean, will they, with, with this information? What, as far as making it public, what can we do? What should we do? What shouldn't we do? What kind of advice do you have on on that? If, if any at all from from anybody well, well I believe it's it's uh, we want to be transparent as we are I mean I think it's to, to share with people what what um, you know we're sharing with people what we would do with the bond funds if the bond is approved mm -hmm. okay and just as we would we can share with people what would be you know how, how we would meet the needs of the district if the bonds not approved so I think you can put those that out there and communicate that to folks and certainly what we've seen tonight is is options we would we would come back in december if need be and have to really hammer those things down as chris showed you know how we could address 25 million that's one way we could address the 25 million dollar deficit um we could adjust those values in different categories through class size or different different things so you would have that as options and then what you've seen tonight is multiple options of rezoning but i think it's fair to say at this point that there'd be significant budget impact, um, which would affect the classroom, and rezoning across high school lines would be very likely. Um, you know, now to speak to any particulars, certainly we don't know that for sure because eventually you would have to vote on that to, to, for any of those particulars, but I think those, are, those two things are fair to say at this yeah. point. Has, has everybody had a chance to see this? No. No, you're seeing it. This is this is the first yes sir opportunity. Oh. Well, I'm just saying we're not all here. I'm just yeah. to make sure everybody's everybody's seen this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions tonight, gentlemen? Certainly, we appreciate your time and your feedback very much. Good job, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.